Thank you. Um, so we're a, we are the distributor for Lauer in Australia. We've we've been partnering with them for about I think four or five years now. Uh, we 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 started our company not much longer before that. We we're looking for new products that uh, were original. There's a lot of there's a lot of products in the marketplace where you hear, you know ours is better than theirs, blah, blah, blah. We want to get away from all that. We want to find some interesting new things and Lau will certainly fit that. So as a company, um, they they started out making macro lenses. We'll fl flick to the next slide. We'll, yeah, um, let me jump through that one. Okay, that's where they started. Um, just in a tiny little office space upstairs. Uh, their first ever lens was a 60 mil two to one lens, which was a, an extremely affordable uh, at the time, and it's still available, two to one lens. I think it, it's still available for about six ninety nine, and it's a full frame lens, so it's pretty good bang for buck. And it was quite unique in the fact that it um, it was two to one. Every other macro lens on the market is a is a one to one. And when I get to the macro bit of this presentation, we might just talk about that a bit more to make sure everyone understands what those are about. So these days they've got a they've got two uh, locations in China. Um, everything's original that um the designer of all these lenses has a, or there's a map for where things are so there's two there's a factory um there's the original shanghai factory is a high fa factory now to deal with the much higher output and all the office and everything else headquarters is located in hong kong um so jump to the next slide okay so mr lee is has an interesting background before he started Lauer, he spent um, a couple of decades in Japan. He's designed some incredible lenses from some big name companies that you would be using at the moment um, and for some German brand as well. So he's, he's, an, he's an optical genius. Like he knows how to do some pretty incredible stuff with lenses. So even when we talk about lenses today, which aren't necessarily macro, for example, our 12 mil, which uh, which Timothy uses, uh, can do 15, 16 centimeter macro, uh, which is completely unheard of in the industry. No one, else, everything else is kind of 50 centimeters a meter. Um, he can he he created a lens which is 12 mil wide angle, no distortion, and it does macro as well. So he's he's got some clever ideas as far as optics go. Um, he started the company initially with macro lenses. And if you notice, that's kind of a common theme through everything he does. So even if a lens isn't a macro lens, it will still be very good at macro. Um, so all the wide, all the ultra wide lenses, whether it's the 15 mil, the 12 mil, the nine mil, they can all still focus down to like 12 to 16 centimeters because he's, he's a macro nerd essentially. And that's what he's into. Um, so we'll flick to the next, next screen. Um, so Laua, the company name comes from a, an old story. If we just jump to the next screen, meaning um, old frog. Um, is that there's an old story about a frog that's trapped at the bottom of the well and he can only look out and up and see a very, very narrow view. And that's essentially um, what Mr. Lee was all about. He was into macro photography and he wanted to do lots with that. And he decided to specialize and create, you know, boutique lenses um, for a particular market. Um, that that's how this is actually there's a few lenses to add to this now this this slides were done um a couple of months back and i've edited it since but we've actually got a few on top of this now but essentially that's a lot of the roadmap so you can see there's quite a few macro lenses across the top we've got full frame lenses aps-c lenses uh we do micro four third lenses uh we do stuff for cine stuff for video now as well uh, but you can see it, it sort of turned it most of it falls into two groups it's either macro or it's ultra wide angle lens um and then there's the probe as well which is a macro lens which we'll, we'll go through a little bit later on uh, and everything's quite unique in class if you look at what we do there you're seeing some pretty wild numbers you're seeing 11s and 9s and 12s and things like this whereas most manufacturers tend to tap out around the 15 mil kind of mark uh, for the most part we it's kind of where we start and we go wider from there in the wide angle so, like I said, we play in a different different field to, to where most others do. Okay, so these are, I'm going to just run through a few of our more recent releases. So, we've got some new APO lenses as well as a new um, a new shift lens and a, and a 9mm full frame lens, which I talked about Luke using just before. 
So you might just want to um, explain what an APO lens is and what a shift lens is. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I've got um, I've got slides on um, on those in particular. So an APO lens is um, uh, aprochromatic. Essentially, uh, sharpness is really important with lenses. Um, but what a lot of lens manufacturers don't look at is sharpness as well as the actual the bokeh in the background as well. So this will give you a, a nice sharp lens as well as a, a nice creamy background too. Um, and then as far as a shift lens goes, there's uh, there's a on the there's a slide in a second which will show in pictures what a shift lens does. So if we flip over to um, next, so we'll start it's after the nine mil. So the nine mil essentially is the widest, the widest lens available, the widest rectilinear lens available for a full frame lens camera. Um, and I'll use the the word rectilinear a bit tonight. And for anyone who's not sure what that is, essentially it's um it's the opposite of fisheye. So often when you have a lens on the market that's nine or ten mil, it's that fisheye effect. Everything's distorted and um, you know good for sports and a few sort of niche activities. But all the lower lenses are uh, all but one are rectilinear. So this is a nine mil lens, but everything's flat. And it has incredibly low distortion, uh, given how wide angle this lens is. So you can use our lenses for, for landscape photography and for architecture and things like this, where you want a nice, nice flat line and you don't want a whole curved, curved thing going on. Okay, so this will run, there's a few pictures now we'll have a look at. Um, and the main thing, to, I guess, to look at here is not just how wide they are, but if you look at any converging lines or anywhere it's straight in the picture, you notice all those lines are nice and straight, okay? So again, that's probably the best example of um, keeping straight straight. I mean, that's a nine mil lens and that's probably got less distortion than some of the 15 mil and 40 mil lenses floating around in the marketplace. Yeah, it's such a stronger image when the verticals are vertical. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, nice again, converging lines, but again, everything's straight. Yeah, and there's a landscape. I guess the only thing to be straight there is horizon, but it helps with that straight too. Well, fish lenses are yeah, cool, but yeah, they're the only really... Fish tend to curve the horizon a bit too, don't they? Yeah. And, I mean, look, fish lenses are cool, but they're, I think they're kind of limited in what you can actually do with them. You get them and you sort of borrowed one a couple of times and used it for a bit, and the novelty wears off quite quickly, whereas a rectilinear lens you can use for a lot of, a lot of different things. So in, in terms of physical size, this lens is, is ridiculously small as well. So it's six centimeters long. So it's a full frame lens. That's a nine mil wide lens that, that, and it's only six centimeters long. And again, as you can see, I mentioned before, we've got 12 centimeter close focusing. So it's, it's stupid wide, it's, it's perfectly flat, uh, but also it's gonna get incredibly close. So if you start to, it is one that is harder to get your head around because when you go really, really wide like this, you sort of have to rethink composition because all sorts of things appear in the foreground that never used to. Um, but then you, if you get your head around it, you start to use that to your advantage. And that's why I say, have a look at Luke's um, uh, Instagram. There's a shot maybe three or four back where it's a waterfall and he and you wouldn't even know it's a nine mil wide lens, but he's able to capture a lot more quite close to something. Yeah, it certainly does free up your composition. So that old adage of the sort of foreground, midground, background, the uh, you can get so much in and um, uh, in focus too because everything over a metre is kind of in focus. I should mention too, what's interesting with our lenses is with every single one of our lenses, you can use it with a 100mm filter system. Um, and that's a huge advantage for two reasons. One is if you're going for a bit of a trek, and you're, you're taking all your stuff with you. We've all got too much stuff and we hate lugging it all around, um, but a 100 mil system is going to be in a box, you know, that big. Whereas a 150 mil system, it's a, it's a much bigger box and lots of more of everything to take around. Um, secondly, if you, if you drop a filter, and you will at some point, um, replacing a 100 mil filter is much cheaper than a, um, 
than 150 mil filter system as well. And we do have a filter system, which I might go into another day. Um, it's a brand called H&Y and all of our, there is an adapter available from Lau, which works with all the 100 mil H&Y filters and they go on with a magnetic frame. So it's quick and easy to attach. Uh, and then the glass on the H&Y filters is, um, it's made of uh, a gorilla glass. So you can drop the filter on the concrete from like 10 meters in the air and it won't break. That's some big claims, isn't it, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I've, I've, I've got a couple that I, you know, I, I've taken to the trade shows all the time and I do some stupid hard banging on tables and stuff like this to demonstrate it and I haven't broken <laughs> one yet. So I think we're, <laughs> yeah, we're looking pretty good. If I recall, um, these next few slides run in three. So if I just sort of flick through these and you can see the comparison. So yeah, so this those. is just to show you the difference between the, the angles, I guess, um, in terms of how extreme 9 mil is. So that's 24 to 14 yep. to 9. Yeah, so 14 is kind of usually is wide, is the widest a lot of manufacturers kind of run to um, in terms of your OEM lenses. Well, they typically um, go on range. The 14 to 24 is their wide. Yeah. Uh, their wide. Um, they don't get generally too much wider than that. And then you go out to nine, it's like, well, um, that's how much more you put get out of it. Hmm. And, be and then yeah, I think you do the same on the uh, the next lens. Yep. 24 to 14. 14 to nine. So it's pretty incredible, the difference. Now, the, the next one's really interesting because... Um, sometimes when you talk about the millimeter differences between lenses and you go a, a nine and a 10 mil lens, it doesn't sound like very much. Um, cause there are a couple of 10 mil lenses in the market or even like 11s and 12s. Um, you go, it's not very much, but what people often forget is that the difference between a nine mil lens and a 10 mil lens is 10%. It's not like the difference between a, a you know, an 80 mil lens and an 81 mil lens. It's much, much more profound. Um, so if you I think in the next shots, there's the, yeah, here. So this is a 10 mil lens. Okay. It's quite wide. You can actually see you can fit quite a bit more in just for that one mil extra. Yep. So it doesn't sound like much on paper, um, but in practicality, you, you actually fit a, a fair whack more in. So it's something to bear in mind whenever you're looking sort of anywhere past 20 mil, just remember that every one or two mil means so much more than it does at the um, at the other end of the zoom. So it's better. Even this one at the nine, all the verticals are plumb and everything's all looking yep. uh, not distorted, even the nine and the 10. Yep. Um, so now this is our shift lens. Uh, so it's the, first of all, it's the widest angle shift lens available on the market. There are other shift lenses by other manufacturers. The glass out there at the moment for shift lenses is um, is quite old. Like all the all the shift lenses available on the market right now, I believe from like Canon and Nikon, etc., are uh, getting quite long in the tooth. So optically, this is a much newer lens, and so it's inherently going to be have some things better. Like apart from being wider, it is actually sharper. Um, there'll be some the, some uh, some snapshots later on we can go into that with. So if we just jump to the next frame, I'll just go into what a I'll go run through this first. Anything that's important here. So it's got a three hundred and sixty degree ro rotation, and the reason for that is is it's a um uh, it's a shift lens and it works on one axis. So rather than turning the camera and the lens around, uh, if you if you change positions, you still want to use the shift functionality. So the lens itself pivots on the lens mount. So you can still use a shift functionality in vertical or horizontal. That's why it spins around on a 360 degree um, axis. Um, and this still is compatible with the 100 mil filter system. I'm just gonna whack a light on it, it's starting to get a little bit dark. Got that Melbourne afterglow happening. Yeah. Um, we've got this, these windows half blocked off as well because it will be a baby's room soon. Um, so uh yeah so it's a uh, it creates nice sun stars um it's got quite a decent amount of shift correction available as with other shift lenses but it's the main thing is it's wider than other shift lenses in the market so other shift lenses tend to be sort of 17 to 20 mil this one's got a you know it's a it's a 15 mil shift so you're going to fit a lot more in and because shift lenses are generally speaking used for architecture 
wider is better. It just gives you more options of where you can get into. So is 10 point sun stars consistent right through the lower range? Uh, no, it's something that's on some lenses and not on others. And I, I think it's some people are really into, and I'm, I, it's not something that bothers me either way, personally, with my photography, but it's something that's not easy to necessarily easy to achieve. I think there's like, there's one brand of lens out there that sells a lens purely as a sun star lens. It's its whole selling feature. So to create a nice, perfect sun star is a, is a bit of a feat in itself. Um, and how, I don't know if they're all 10 point sun stars. There are, I think there was a 10 point sun star on the nine mil, but like, I don't think say, I don't think the 15 F2 has a 10 point sun star. I don't know if it's on every single lens. Uh -huh. I've started, I've started seeing it pop up in more recent Lao models more often. So do you do the shift in APS-C? Or only in full frame and it's in full frame, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um there is a 15mm F4 lens we had, it was second Lauer's second ever made lens, and that was a shift lens as well. Um, we'll go into that in a macro section later on. Um, that is a shift lens, but when you use it a shift lens, you can only use the APS-C area of your frame on a full frame camera, so you'll need to crop it later on. This is a, a true full frame lens. Um, and it's also available for mirrorless cameras. So we're pretty much mirrorless focused these days. We haven't really done much for, um, some of our lenses will come out in dual mounts, but at the very least, every single lens will come out in a, in a mirrorless options. Some will be mirrorless only now as well. Um, and the reason that is, is if you make a lens mirrorless only, you can actually engineer that lens to be much smaller um, than if you engineer it for a, for a dual mirrorless and SLR. Um, okay, so this is, is, I'm just curious, how, who's familiar with shift lenses here? Does everybody understand what they're about or wait, is this yep. new for everyone? Yep. No, no. yep. I've never used one, but I've seen people struggle with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can totally understand. I can understand that. Um, so look, if we see the image on the left. All the images I showed you earlier on with the 9mm lens, they're perfectly sharp straight lines but you get that convergence where the things start to lean in uh shift essentially lets you straighten everything and you can do a certain amount in photoshop but if you can correct it optically um if you can correct anything optically to begin with it's always better than if you correct things digitally later on so you can get a nice straight nice straight lines in your image um no matter how wide you know this is and for, particularly with a 15 mil lens that convergence becomes much more of an issue um, than it does with, say, a, you know, like a 20 mil lens or something like that. And particularly when you start to tilt things up or tilt things down as well, um, that, that convergence effect happens, happens a lot more. So this is a couple of examples here. Oh, okay, so this is a 17 versus a 15 um, to compare the, the width. So the next widest shift lens on the market is a 17 mil. Uh, and this gets back to what I was saying before, where sometimes it sounds like only a couple of mil and you think, oh, well, not a big deal. Uh, but in this case, you can see it's the, it's the difference between fitting and building in frame or not fitting in frame. Okay, again, 17 versus 15. There's a couple of photos here to give you an idea of the, the difference in width. And again, because this is, I guess this is where shift lenses come into, you know, generally people are taking pictures of buildings of the outside of buildings all the inside of buildings and shift lenses. So wide really helps a lot in this instance to have the widest lens that you can you can get access to. Okay, again, 17 versus 15. Oh, wait, is that? Yeah. Yep, it's the Canon versus the lower. Yeah. So the Canon, um, and even there, it's even actually obvious in there, the difference in resolution of the lenses. Um, there's some close-ups later on, but to be to be fair like the um the, the canon is like a 10 or 15 year old lens it's not new so it's probably natural that the optically the lower is going to be a is is going to be a superior product in terms of sharpness um but um but yeah it's, it's wider at the same time as being a sharper lens as well and they'll probably release a 
a shift lens at some point for mirrorless, I'm sure. Um, but it'll probably run at two or three times the price. I'm having a guess. Okay, that's just a just a quick sharpness chart, just to give you an idea of the difference, as I said before. Um, so if you, I don't know if you're into pixel peeping or not. Um, not everyone is, but just to give you an idea of that, we have the the widest possible shift lens on the market, but we've also got basically the, the sharpest shift lens on the market as well. Uh, also distortion, um, we use these grids to show distortion. Uh, you can see on the Canon, it's not too bad. It's a little bit wonky, but you can see the Nikon has a an all, like a, a fair whack of um, it's like a Boeing almost, almost not fisheye, but you can see that Boeing certainly from the middle. That's the magnetic filter holder system. It's available for most of our wide angle lenses. So that frame around the outside on the on the filter, that's a conventional one hundred mil filter. So if you have a one set of 100 mil filters, you can actually get those frames for them um, and then pop your existing filter into that magnetic frame. The reason we use a magnetic frame system for our wide angle lenses is it actually allows you to put well, a 100 mil filter system on a much wider lens. Because any of you who are using, are you, you guys all using square filters at the moment? Is there anyone using square filters? So you know it's got the, the big blinkers on the side. So that's for an ultra wide lens, this is not a great thing. So we've been able to do away with that. So these magnets, they're very thin frames on the filters themselves. So you can stack up to two or three filters on the front and you won't get any vignetting. You certainly don't have those, um, those blinders on the side. Those essentially create sort of a limit on what lens you can put it on. And that's why you often have to go up to a, a 150 mil system uh, with a lot of lenses is because physically the, the holder system is the limitation. So mate, it, it's also as a side thing, it's just, it's a damn sight easier throwing a magnetic filter on rather than um, mucking around trying to slide in, particularly at night time as well. Okay, so this is our, um, our new range of products called Argus, like a subcategory of Lauer and We've, they've developed a number of F.95 lenses. So there's only been a handful of F.95 lenses that ever made. Uh, traditionally though, they sort of tap out at around 50 mil. I don't think before this, anyone did anything wider than a 50 mil lens. Uh, so for example, you can buy a Leica Noctilux. Uh, it's around, I think it's like 15 or $20,000. Uh, and that's a that's a 50 mil lens. Um, it's an f.095. Uh, many years ago, Canon did one um, in their FD system, and it was terrible. Uh, so, and then we've got this new this new lens out now. It's a 35 mil f.95. So, uh, it gives you a, a different perspective to what's available on the market, or uh, compared to the handful of other f.95 lenses that are available. What sort of price points this one at? Uh, off the top of my head, I think it was around the two-ish mark. Yep. I need to come back and check that in a second. I'm having trouble remembering every single lens we do now in but terms even, of price. Even, so two, two grand versus 15, you get an awful lot of lower lens for uh, for the money. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. And we don't have a Leica badge on it, so you lose the... Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But you do a Leica. You lose the bragging rights. Um, yeah. But it I does have a red dot, though. What, what would you use a 0.95... That's you'll stuff. see in a minute, Roger. Oh, that's it. Yeah, it's, yeah, you, you'll see. So essentially, it's um, any any low light situation. It means you can work in lower light than you would with a one point four NF two, and for subject. So if we, you'll see subject separation soon. Yeah. Um, so it's also it's fifty centimeter is the closest focusing distance, which is le the least closest focusing of any lower lens, but it's closer focusing than any other f point nine five lens on the market. Um, it's quite compact as well. Um, everything's every lens in the lower range is quite small. Uh, it's also got low focus breathing. Now that's a feature which you guys probably don't really care at all about, uh, but we do have a lot of people who are using these for cine. And just so you can um, learn a new thing today, if you don't know what it is, uh, focus breathing is if you look through a lens and you don't zoom it at all, and you turn your focus ring, 
you'll actually notice everything gets slightly bigger and smaller as you change focus. And cine, people who are doing cine don't like that because when you're doing a stationary photo, it doesn't matter because you're taking one shot at one time. But if you go to pull focus and the subject changes its position inside the frame, like forward or backwards on TV or whatever, that's not very good. So when they when you talk about broadcast lenses, that's a it's a key thing that focused breathing is a is a is something that don't like at all. Um, so because we're a lot of our lenses are starting to be used in cinemas in the in the video space, that's a, a feature that they made a priority with this lens. Adam, could yep. you, when you're going through the features, also let me know what uh, is the exposure? Are they auto exposure or manual exposure? And are they okay, so, auto focus or manual? Focus? Yeah, no, no. All our lenses are completely manual. Um, they're comp manual focus, manual manual aperture, uh, and they're built like tanks. When you pick one up, the, when the, you they, they're they're all manual exposure, manual focus. Correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and look it, for. And the ultra wide lenses, um, because we do ultra wide and macro, it the focus part of it kind of doesn't really matter because I don't know about I'm gonna just drop something. I don't like for macro, I've never used an autofocus macro lens in autofocus. Like they're impossibly hard to use auto. I generally with a macro lens, I throw it to manual focus slap mode and I I move the lens in and out slightly to get the subject in focus. I don't even use the focus ring. Um, this is like for years and years and years, the way I've done macro. Um, and when you get to, especially when you get to a stronger magnifications like two to one, it's pretty much impossible to use autofocus because an AF system can't pick between a, an, ant's, an ant's bottom and an ant's head. Like it's, too small a too small a target in those high magnifications, and then for ultra wide, like you know, when you're talking ultra wide lenses, um, most of them have a hyperfocal range of like a meter or something. So kind of unless you're shooting something that's closer to a meter, you're hardly going to be focusing anyway. Like you know, when you hit affinity, pretty soon. I use my I use my twelve mil for landscape and astro mic, and it just stays on infinity, and I never focus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So, um, ultra wide, it's kind of a you know, that's you know, like GoPro cameras, they're all ultra wide lenses and they, yeah. they don't need an autofocus system because when you're that wide, it just doesn't matter. It's fantastic for Astro because you know, that instead of having to fiddle around in the dark trying to figure out how, how to focus your, your lens, you just uh, roll it around to infinity and that's it, and all you got to do is point. <laughs> so, it's fantastic. So when you're talking the, the f.95 lens, it's probably that is it that is a place where you know AF might be handy, but then I don't know how well any AF system would actually handle an f.095 lens as well. Like I don't, we've never seen, no one's ever made an autofocus f.95 lens. All the f.95 lenses that exist are all manual focus lenses, um, and there's probably a reason for that. I'm, I'm, I'm having a guess. Um, but I use uh, a Sony camera and I just use the focus peaking. So have you guys used focus peaking yeah. at all on your cameras? So it's dead easy. Like it, it makes it, because um, I come from using a range finder before, before switching to a Sony with focus peaking on these lenses. And it's just like cheat mode almost using um, focus peaking after using a range finder. These, these next two images are for you, Roger, because this shows oh, you the good. difference between the 2.8 and the 0.95. So you've got yep. the 2.8 in mind? Who, me? Yeah, look I, at the difference I, between the background between the 2.8 and the 0.95. Oh, yeah. So normally to, to achieve that kind of separation, you have to use a long throw lens, like 100 mil or something. Yeah. Uh, but this allows you to do portrait shots with a wider angle lens it's just opening up a new it's a new tool in your kit that lets you shoot from a whole different perspective and well, we'll there's another lens later on i'll show you the 15 mil one-to-one -one that's a similar thing it just allows you to do shooting different ways to before and then this is this is comparing the background so if you've got a 50 mil f.95 that's how much of the background is in shot and with the, the 35 mil f.95 it's just a different different feel a different look there's less compression in the background there as well. 
It actually handles the um, looks like brightness around the subject is better as well. So yeah, I think it does. It's, it's, it seems better exposed. Yeah, it's weird. It's jacked on that middle, but yeah. Hmm. So um, yeah. Um, and the interesting thing about lower lenses too is they don't. Uh, the images are the, the lens is doing whatever it's doing. A lot of manufacturers' lenses don't look like they do. Um, when they hit the sensor, a lot of them have corrections and stuff. When then the camera fixes it up and then they come out the back, this doesn't have that advantage. So it's the lens doing all the work with the lower lens. I think these are just some 0.95 samples, yeah. aren't they, the next year? Yep. I've got a couple of guys who are interested in trying them for astrophotography as well come the next um next astro season they want to stick him on those um those tracker type things yep so this is a 33 mm 0.95 um but this is for APS-C cameras so what Lara have done with a couple of their lenses and you'll see later on with macro is they they, they make the same lens and they engineer everything smaller the glass the chassis everything they just engineer everything smaller to go on an APS-C camera so um so uh, if you guys know APS-C full frame Yep. yep. The, I think the um, smallest lens size. Yep. I think the Olympus is an APS-C, isn't it? Uh, and Olympus is smaller again. Olympus is micro okay. four thirds. So for this lens, uh, we have a, a the fifty mil and a thirty three, but we have something coming for the Olympus, which is a twenty five mil. So they'll all be f 095 and you'll have a fifty mil, a thirty three mil, and a twenty five mil, but they'll all give you exactly the same um, width because a, an APS-C micro four thirds sensor, it's field of view is half that of a, of a full frame. So your 25 mil will give you um, the equivalent of a 50 mil on a full frame camera. And the 33 mil will give you the equivalent of a, of a on APS-C will give you the equivalent of a 50 mil on a full frame camera. So it's like they did that, use that machine on Willy Wonka where they put the chocolate bar in and they just make everything smaller. <laughs> um so again all much the same features there's nothing you know ridiculous new here again there's a few features at the bottom so long throw uh, you know low focus breathing video is a video um, priority thing long focus throw again that's more of a video thing they like to be able to not have everything move quickly so you can do nice soft focus pulls um internal focusing and a stop the stepless aperture ring it doesn't have clicks Again, that's a something that's been designed that way because the video users don't like having clicks in their aperture. They like a nice smooth aperture. So okay. internal focusing that doesn't change length. Is that the deal? Yeah, yeah, correct. Here's some samples again from that one. You get an incredible background with them, don't you? Yeah, it's nice. It's just a, again, it's just a nice, a different way. You can do things you can't do with other lenses. It just really separates the subject. Yeah. But without having to have everything really tight and compressed as well. All right. So um, we said we might give you a little bit of a break at half time so you can, you can fill up your wine glass. Um, so do you want to have a five minute break now before we go through the macro stuff? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, why don't we do that? So it's eight twenty-four now. So why don't we reconvene eight thirty? Yep. Um, no everyone worries. can uh, can charge their glasses with their their uh, preferred beverage, and we'll uh, keep on going at eight thirty. No worries. Cool.
Roger, you might want to mute. Roger before he embarrasses himself. You're being inspired there, Graham. Are you going to rush out and get your 0.95 lens so you can have a beautiful oh, box in the background? Jack's just sort of trying to compare him against his Canon 65 and, uh, <laughs> and looking at the one that looks like it's a uh, multi zoo with a great big long tube on it. You know, <laughs> well, that's, that's the uh, that's the probe lens. We're about to uh, have a chat about that, but uh, there's a little video at the end which shows. Um, a guy having a bit of fun with it, playing with it like it's a bazooka, but actually showing you what it does. So, um, uh, but it does some in incredibly great sort of cinematography type, uh, you know, the commercial type stuff where you get the lens sort of moving in between stuff and um, yeah. it's a fantastic lens. Yeah. Something different, that's for sure. <clears throat> I don't think I'd be paying out a lot of dollars for it because <laughs> it'd be like, one or two of the lenses I've got, you never touch from one season to the next. That's right. There are there are a few companies around um, which are worth exploring, which will loan your lenses, and it's not that expensive. So if you just got a little project to do, instead of going to the cost of having to sell an arm or a leg, you can, um, you know, for a few, couple hundred bucks, you can actually borrow some pretty fancy lenses. Yeah, well, I'm impressed with the new RF lenses that come out for Canon. Yeah. Um, I, the one I'm looking at, it's the 100 to 500 zoom, mm. which could take the two times um, extender. Yep. Uh, but by the time you put the extender on and that, you're looking around at even really good price. You're looking about uh, uh, five and a half, 
six thousand dollars sort of price point, you know. So, but again, one hundred, five hundred is a great lens if you're um, in the right sort of atmosphere to use that sort of lens. Is so, that the one with the built-in teleconverter, or uh, you got to buy that separately? No, that's, that's Nikon, isn't it? That's, that's Nikon. Nikon. Yeah. Right. yeah. Is that the twenty thousand dollar lens that we looked at the other day? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the one I said you couldn't buy. Yeah. I couldn't think of a reason to use it, so why would I? Buy it? I yeah, saw a, a um a really cool five hundred mil lens the other day, um, and it's by uh, Takina. Okay. And it's a. Do you remember mirror lenses? Does anyone know what mirror lenses are? They, they used to be like a big deal in like the 80s and 70s and they use like telescopes, light bouncing around inside them. But it, it allows them to make a 500 mil lens that is manual focus, but it's like it's like that long. Hmm. Um, and it's, you know, the, the review is like, look, it's not great. Like this, the 500 mil lens that's this big is going to be much better. But it, as a travel lens, he was like, this is a really cool little bit of glass. Hmm. So I like because I like everything to be as compact as possible when I'm traveling. I don't like to take much stuff. Um, I, I don't want to find that my my photo takings it's sucking the enjoyment out of my actual travel experience. Mm. Yeah, I think my um, that's why Luke has obviously gone for the nine mil for the um, for his landscape work. But even even my twelve mil is half the length of the fourteen to twenty four Nikon because that's on the D eight fifty. Yeah. So, so really compact when you're talking about just if you've got to choose a lens to to go somewhere with it. Just uh, it's like same reason people used to buy Olympus is just the size of the stuff for travelling. Yeah, and it all adds up. I mean, if you knock a quarter of the size off five lenses, you you save a lot of size and weight in your camera bag as well. Back in business. All right, well, let's um, go for part two. Um, so I need to share this screen again. All right, so hopefully all that's... Look what I found. <laughs> okay. Looking like a Shiraz to me. Yeah, Devil's Lair. Oh, very nice. Ah, nice. Yeah, it's really good. I should have bought more. Um don't you always say that about wine? Yeah, because it's like I've got to put some away, but man, it tastes nice. Just one more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before I get stuck into macro lenses, does everyone understand what these two to one, one to one, five to ones these all mean? Or would you like me to talk you through? I think you need to talk us through. Okay. Okay. Um, it's the one slide I forgot to buddy put in as well. But essentially, um, when you see a one-to-one -one lens, what they call it, you know, normally a true macro lens by Nikon or Sigma or Canon or whoever, typically they're one-to-one. -one. And what that means is if something is one centimetre in real life, it'll take up one centimetre on your film plane or your sensor inside the camera. Okay, so if you've got a coin and it's as big, like it'll, it'll be, yeah, it'll be that big on your sensor. So when you it'll fill the whole picture frame if it's as big as the sensor is. Does that, does that, yep. is that a, have I explained that properly? Yep. 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 So that's one-to-one. -one. And our, our lenders, with the exception of the 15 mil, actually start at two-to-one. And that is, it's, they're twice as powerful as any other macros on the market. So if it's um, half a centimetre in real life, it'll be a whole centimetre on the film plane. So you're getting twice the magnification of any other macro lens, okay? So, and you can see there, with the exception of the 15 mil, which is a kind of a freak lens in itself, um, they, they all start at two to one. So you're getting double the magnification with almost any lower lens that you buy, okay? Um, so we'll start with um, the first lens, which should be the 15 mil. Okay, so the 15mm one-to-one, this is something, nobody does anything even slightly close to this, you know, because normally if you look out there at at one-to-one -one macros, they're, they're, they're either 80mm or 100mm, um, 
there might be something around the 60 or 70 mil. But typically, there's nothing wide. There's nothing wider than 50 that does a one-to-one -one ratio. And it's, again, doing that thing where we're, you know, we're offering a product that can do something that nothing else can do on the market, which is why we fell in love with the brand ourselves. We're like, we just like that they've come out with this whole new set of tools that lets you take photos, different kinds of photos to what you could before. And, again, this is something that you as you have it for a while, you'll start to learn to make images look better and better because you'll start to think about composition because you've got to start to think about having a, like in this picture, a subject in the foreground and then something in the background. Because suddenly, rather than with the 100 mil macro normally, you've just got to focus on a subject and it's a really nice sharp subject, but everything in the background is blurry because it's a 100 mil and your depth of field is almost nothing. So this lets you take com completely different images. Second, on a, on a side note, as I touched on earlier, um, this is also a shift lens. But when you use it as a shift lens, it will, it will only give you the, it will, you'll get vignetting. So you can only use it the, the section of the frame that's equivalent to an APS-C sensor. So um, APS-C sensors are smaller frame size. There's some Nikon and Canon cameras that are around which are an APS-C sensor size, but are you guys all using full frame cameras? Uh, a bit of a mixture. A mixture, okay. So the smaller frame cameras, it won't matter to, but if you're using a full frame camera, um, you just need to know if you do use the shift function at all, um, it, it will, you'll get a tiny bit of vignetting if you do use the shift function. But apart from that, you'll never get vignetting if you're not using the shift function. Most people don't buy it for the shift feature. Most people buy it because they want this really really wide angle view but at the same time very close focusing we've seen this this lens has been really popular um with people who are shooting those um have you seen those glowing mushrooms yep yeah so have, people uh, who are... jennifer in our midst is a uh, an aficionado of the uh the ghost mushrooms yep she's so, a tracer of those yep so here's um, the lens for you jen <laughs> um so yeah it's, it's it's popular with that um that that market we've got one i think being loaned out at the moment to a chap up near lismore and he's a he shoots for like bbc and stuff like that he's a mushroom i can't remember his name on top of my head he does like mushroom, he's just mushroom yeah. shooting expert so you're telling us this is a single shot eh? yeah yeah this is a single photo they've used a, a flash off camera somewhere and um so because yeah. it's within that um, macro range in the foreground it's in focus yeah and then you're using the 15 mil um for the distance to pick up that in focus as well yep yep cool extraordinary that's if um, it sits still for 15 seconds well it doesn't they'd use a flash to freeze it oh. <laughs> yeah um so you don't need to the light on it for a quick quick it's a bit second. of a light paint okay. capture it there yeah yep. cool. um there's another crate example Again, you're just doing these kind of surreal pictures. Uh, one image that's my favourite is on the Instagram page. I couldn't find a, a high-res version of it. It's, a, it's of a praying mantis, and it looks like something out of an alien movie because the insects, the scale in your head sort of gets thrown out because the trees look like real life-size in the background. Um, you can see you can, just, you can just do wild compositions, and it's really limited by what you can come up with. So what's the focal distance on the 15 mil? Uh, well, it's one to one. I don't know physically. I don't know what that is, but it will fill the frame. Yeah. So it's basically touching the lens, like almost. You can. Yep. You know, you're, you're, the challenge with this lens is getting the lighting in because the lens is this big, and mm. you, you can focus on things that are like this far from the front of the lens. So you've got to get it lit in the front there. Quite a strong light. So ring yep. lighting and all sorts of other fancy. Yeah, a ring light or something that comes even more probably more sideways than a ring light. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, here's another example. Again, it's just, a, these are all wide angle photos that look and have a completely different aesthetic to, um, or to macro photos that have a different aesthetic to what you'll normally see. The bearded iris or something. Okay, now there's only two lenses on the market that are in this range. Uh, we make one, uh, Canon makes one. 
Uh, they're both 25 mil, 2.5 to 1 to 5 to 1. Um, but ours is about 10 or 15 years newer. So optically, it has a little bit of an edge. Um, the, the two big advantages, though, are one, it's available in lots of other mounts. So it's not just for the Canon market. But secondly, it's very narrow. Um, if you see at the front of that lens, um, it's, it's probably about the size of a 20 cent piece, the tip of it. Uh, but the Canon lens is, is quite large. It's like a 58 or 60 something mil front on it. So getting light into a subject is quite difficult when it's, when it's such a high magnification. So as I said before, one to one and two to one is, is quite powerful. Now we're talking about something that makes uh, something it's one centimeter, five centimeters on your film plane. So you can you'd only get if you film if you took a photo of something that's one centimeter, you'd only fit a quarter of it onto your actual image. Okay, so it's getting stupid, stupid close. Now, I will say, if you've not shot macro before, don't buy this lens. This is not a first macro lens for anyone to buy. You should buy 100 mil from us or from anyone else. Do not buy this lens as your first macro lens because it's um, it's a different beast. It's it's harder to work with. Um, it, it won't infinite focus, so you can't use it for things that aren't macro. And the depth of field when you're working with these kind of magnifications is just stupidly, stupidly small. So most of the images you'll see here are doing what they call focus stacking. And that's where they take, they have a camera on a rail. Some people do this by hand as well. And you take a series of images and then you swoosh them together, all the sharp bits together basically, because they'll be in, you, you'll have the camera in slightly different positions. So you'll, you're taking all the, the sharp bits and sandwiching them all together. And that's what's done for all the best even regular macro lenses, people do that often with those as well because you can get the, the most stunning macro images will be when you're doing focus stacking. And this, this lens is almost impossible to shoot. You can use it without focus stacking, but your depth of field is going to be so absurdly small that it's not practical to use just for a one-shot image in most situations. So just to prove that point, we've got one in the, uh, in the kit for people to try. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll get. Um, I'll just see if I can quickly show you. Um, I'm just going to grab. Let's, let's, let's want to share this one image. If you just put it in the chat, it'll come up as an image. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So um, if I go to, because I took an image um, of a coin. It will something to demonstrate to you how, how crazy close this is and uh, how crazy close the depth of field is more to the point. Um, that's not the one. Okay, this one. Copy, copy link. We go back to Zoom. I'll pop this one in here. So this image here is on Instagram and it shows you, you know what a Lego, a Lego figure is? Yep. Um, and you're familiar, everyone knows how big a Lego figure is. Uh, they're good for scale. Um, and you can see the imperfection on it and how much is in focus of that Lego figure. Um, <laughs> oh. Okay. That's the depth awesome. of field that we're working with, right? So um, I'll just send you one other Instagram image because this is going to give you a bit of context for how close it can get because we all know how big a 50 cent piece is in Australia. Um, because the insects, nobody knows how big any insect is. I'm going to show you tonight, so I'll show you this because everyone knows how big an in, uh, 50 cent piece is. So, this has two images one is further back, and it's of the actual setup. And if you slide across, you'll see, um, you'll see it zoomed in to the edge of a 50 cent piece. Wow, fantastic! Yeah, so. That's how close, it's just ridiculous. Um, but it, it's a really cool lens, but I'm just saying, um, yeah, I'm just saying that you'll have a uh, um, hard time using it if it's a first, first lens. Get a 100 mil or something else to begin with with macro. 
And then you can even you can even practice, you can do focus stacking with those 100 mil lenses. Um, someone's asked about the kit. Yep. yep. So yes, we do. We've got a, a kit of, the, of three lenses. Um, and uh, uh, the idea is to either get together on Sunday or Monday, 2 p.m. at our place. And uh, you can come and try them out, Roger. If you get that case, I'm not sure what's happening with that case as well. There's a hundred mil in that lens as well. So you might have well. to, okay. there's a hundred mil macro in that. Yeah. Yeah. Robin's got a couple of um, spare Sony bodies. So um, if, uh, if the mount isn't right for your camera, you can, you can play with a Sony body and lens. I just bring along an SD card. All righty. So now we've just got some example photos of this lens. You can see the insane thing that people can do. Yep. So going to the previous one, it looks like they've used a ring light there because you could see it in the bug's eyes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's, um, I've never asked him, but um, uh, Katut Suitra, does he, uh, does he shoot with uh, your macro lenses? Because he comes up with some pretty fantastic... Uh, I don't know. Is he in the macro group, a macro... Um... Uh, he runs, I think he runs his own sort of, um, uh, sort of print photography business, but he's, uh, okay. he keeps on posting things like this image. Yeah, so I'm not sure. sure. Maybe, I don't know. Wow. I'm glad insects are learning the size they are. I hate to see them yeah. now. So <laughs> yeah. Look at the drops on that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty remember, wild. Do you remember the guy who shot, um, it was a fruit fly, and he did it for the Australian Geographic, wasn't it? Mm. And he, he set it up, and it was on a rail, and he focus stacked the whole thing. And this, there was some extraordinary number of images, um, sort of uh, 300,000 images, and it took the computer a week and a half to process it all to focus stack the whole thing. But it was uh, sharp front to back for the whole image. Quite extraordinary. The focus rails are quite cheap now too. You can get a decent one for like two or 300 bucks. Yep. And again, what I did is I put this image in. It's a bit of a context as we know how big it matches. So not the most glamorous of subjects, but just to give you an idea of um, how big or how close it's getting. It's a fantastic detail, isn't it? Mm. Okay, now these next two lenses, I've done a bit of a two for one with the demo photos because remember I talked before about the F.95, how we had the same lens, it's essentially shrunk down. So in fact, I should have put three lenses up here in thinking about it now that I speak it through. We've got a, a 100 mil APO, which came out first. It actually won the Taper Award for the best macro lens that year. And also it won another category of award that, that year. Um, and then we released a 65 mil, which is exactly the same lens, but it's been designed for APS-C. If you have Olympus, we have a 50 mil two to one. Optically, they are, they're identical, except each one is smaller. So you'll find the 50 mil is like almost half the size of the 100 mil lens. Um, but you'll get the same results with all of these lenses because they are engine, engineering wise, they use the same technology across all three. And, and internally, they look very much the same, except they're just smaller or larger. So again, these are APO lenses. So you're getting a nice soft background as well as sharp foreground and nice, um, nice, nice balanced lighting across the, the frame as well. And optically, um, Optically, the 100 mil 2.8 APO by Lauer is the best macro lens in the market, full stop. Um, I think before this came out, because there's, a, there's a, a site you can look up called Lens Tip, and these guys are not uh, uh, an airy fairy review site. These guys are like full blown lens nerds, and they put lenses on charts and tear downs, and they, they do like a really scientific analysis of lenses. And basically, before this came out, the Sony macro was the best macro on the market. And this edged out the Sony lens on the market uh, in, in terms of macro and in terms of long distance performance as well. So we optically, this is the best lens on the market. But in addition to that, 
it's a two to one. Everything else that's out in the market now is a hundred mil is a one to one. Ours is a two to one. So you're getting double the magnification of Adam, any other hundred mil lens. Can I ask a clarifying question on the two to one? What would be the difference if that was a 200 millimeter f2.8 as compared to 100 with your 2.1 feature? Um, no, so if it's a two to one or a one to one, so if it's a one to one lens, the, the the amount of mils that lens is is irrelevant because if it's it it, it just means that one way or another, the, when you can move that that camera the closest you can within that lens's capability, the most it can fill the frame is amount X, okay? So um, if you have a one-to-one 200 mil or a one-to-one 50 mil, they can still, whenever they are at their closest possible point which you can focus, um, you'll only get a one-to-one, you'll get a one-to-one image. So if it's a five cent piece, it'll almost perfectly fill your frame. But your 200 mil, the advantage of a 200 mil would be that you can take that image further back. So if you're taking a lot of photos of like bees, a 200 mil one-to-one is probably a better lens to have than a 50 mil one-to-one because you'll have to be a lot closer to get to get that same shot. But their capability as far as how much they can fill the frame will be identical. Oh, the other thing that would differ um, is your background blur. So remember we talked about before with the 35 mil versus the 50 mil? Um, the, the, the narrower, the longer the lens, the more, the quickly, the more quickly the background blows and it blows more and it compresses. So your, your 200 mil would give you a, everything is squashed in more and right. everything will be blurrier than it will be with a 50 mil, for example. But, but the actual image of the mug that you're taking or whatever would be approximately the same. Exactly. Yeah, exactly the same. A one-to-one is about how close it can focus. So, so uh, I presume these lenses will focus to infinity. Yeah, these except not, for that twenty, that last one I showed you, that special. No, no, but this, well, the hundred, the hundred mil one. Hundred mil definitely infinity. Yes, and, and everything else focuses to infinity. So, is it is it equivalent if you do it if you're focusing to infinity, equivalent to a two hundred mil lens? No, no, it's a still hundred mil lens. Yeah, we've got a shot yeah. coming up of a landscape taken with a hundred mil macro. Right? Yeah, so it just means that. Um, but, but, but if it's a, you've got your two to one. Yep. That doesn't apply in the entire focal length range. No, of no, okay. So where that's different, right, is if you have two 100 mil lenses, and one is a one to one, and one is a two to one. Where your one to one, you might have to stop here. Your two to one, you can keep going for a bit, and it's in focus. But what if okay. what if you're focusing at something that's in, at infinity? Um, that doesn't matter then what it is. But so you're getting the same at infinity. You get the same size image. With the yeah, it's got no. It's got no. The two to one and one to one have no bearing on your focal length. They all are a measurement of how close you can, how much you can fill the frame with something. When that's it's close, how how close you can bring something before it goes blurry. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Is um, it relevant? Can I ask, is it relevant to a subject matter that you're interested in shooting or is it relevant to another piece of kit that you've got or looking at? I'm just trying to understand. Well, I'm just trying, to, I'm trying to understand how it works. The, yep. the two to, uh, the, I'm trying to understand the two to one versus one to one. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. All. It just simply means that um, like a, you know, a photo frame is um, a, a sensor is, well, um, Adam, looking at it that way, would it mean that using a two to one lens, you only have to go half as close as you do with a one to one? Uh, two to one. To fill the no, same amount of frame? No, you'd still go the same distance if they're both 100 mil lenses. It would just mean that you keep going closer. To get it in one. focus. That's right. You, you can keep, no, you can keep moving it towards a, a macro subject. Whereas if you got, what would happen is if you had a one to one lens, and your one-to-one -one goes there, and if it goes any closer, it, go, it goes blurry, and that's your closest point. So does Go that on. also depend upon the the focusing capability of the lens? If it goes beyond, uh... yeah. So if you've got a if you've got a one-to-one -one lens, right, and it can go this close, and if it goes any closer, it goes out of focus, right? If you've got a two-to-one, you can keep doing this for a bit. But some hundred-millimeter lens like this 
can focus in closer than one to one? No, they can't. What about the Canon RF 100? That's a one to one. But they can go, it's got a focal distance of, um, of more than 100. Well, I, I don't know the right terms, but you can go in closer. But it, it can't, um, I'm just trying to think if there's a better way to explain this. You want, it's not, it's still, um, it's still going to print. So the image, if you go, um, say that's your film frame, right? Yeah. That's your, your sensor and your camera. And, and if something's this big in real life, it will end up this big on your sensor. Okay. Right. But if it's a two to one lens, you can get that to be twice as big on this film frame. So it would be up to there. Mm. So you get twice as much detail because it gets, and it's irrelevant to how physically close the lens goes because, it, and it's irrelevant to focal length. It's about how big it ultimately can make it on your sensor. It's almost like it's got a, at that stage, it's got a zoom on it. To zoom it's in. almost, Michael, like putting a magnifying glass on the front of the lens. Yeah. That might be, yeah. I, I don't know if that's an easy way to explain it. but That it's, might be, yeah. Yep. yeah. But a one-to-one, -one for the two-to-one, it's like putting a magnifying glass in front of it. So yep. at infinity, everything's the same when you look through, but it's on that close-up and it's how close you can get into the subject. Yeah, or if you hit the 200% button on Photoshop, it does that, but yeah. you don't lose quality. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank, thank you, Adam. Yeah. It, it, can be a, it can be a bit of a tough one to, yeah. I remember it's the last it. thing that I got my head around when I started working in a camera store years ago. Just, just a quick question. In the other kit I'm picking up, is there a 9mm f5.6? Um, I think there actually isn't because... I think that's one thing that, oh, in the other lane, the other kit, I pulled something out to put the 100 mil in. I've got a okay. feeling it Whether it, I'll yeah. find out tomorrow if I'm yeah, yeah. to tomorrow. I think I had to yeah. make way for the 100 mil that's not normally in there. Yep. Okay. Yep. I think that's the 9 mil that Luke's got right now, actually. He wanted to, yeah, we did a bit because of it. Because he went trekking with it. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Mike, um, in the kit for trying is the 100 mil F2.8. Two to one, so yep. you can actually play with it and see what it does. In, a, in an away. RF, in an RF mount, uh, uh, we can lend you a Sony body to use. To no, play with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What we do is with these kits, we often have the SLR lens in there with maybe Canon and Nikon or a, or a Sony mirrorless adapter, because we often find a lot of people who have an R body will have an EF adapter. Um, or you know you can you can adapt from you can adapt yeah, from SLR. Yeah. You, you got know? an EF adapter, Mike? Yep. All yeah, right, see? you're in business. Yeah. So there we go. So yeah, that's that's why we um you can adapt SLR things to mirrorless camera lenses to mirrorless bodies, but you can't adapt a a mirrorless lens to a an, an SLR body. So we no, no. where possible the, the loan out the demo lenses are actually SLR lenses. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Those okay. Are some so shots of the uh, of the hundred mil, are they? Yeah. yeah. So this first shot I chose again, it's just one of those context shots because people know how big pencils are. And if you look at um, with these images too, not just the sharpness, but the blur on these is it's just incredibly soft. Um, some lenses do out of focus really ugly. Uh, they don't do a nice out of focus. But this lens has just such a nice, soft, out of focus area. And the graduation from sharp to out of focus is really, really nice as well. What price point's the 100 mil, Adam? Um, I think 899 off the top of my head. I'll check that right now. Incredibly cost effective lenses, the lower lenses. Yeah. I, I think the. Um, uh, what's the tilt shift? I think was uh, twelve hundred bucks or something, wasn't it? Um, I'm just checking now. I'll check the hundred mil first. Hundred mil is eight forty nine, even better. But you can buy it for eight ninety nine if you want. Um, <laughs> lens. Um, <laughs> it's a bottle of wine. If, oh, my, my search menu sucks on the phone. Um, Fifteen mil shift. Okay, nineteen ninety nine for the shift. 
Yeah, so two grand. You're paying twice that for a Nikon. It's yeah. not more. Yeah. Well. And I suppose the Canon's probably similarly priced, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think Canon or Nikon have anything new anyway. Their no. their glass is pretty old. Mil. I wouldn't buy the new. I'd wait till they brought out a new R version or something if I was going to get a genuine Canon. I think look, that background is nice and soft. Like I just love how soft the the backgrounds are in this. Is that asparagus, Eric? What do you reckon that yep. is? Yeah. Oh, Adam, sorry, just the last shot of the praying mantis. Is that um, just a single shot? That's not a focus that step. Oh, um, is it? Yeah, but single shot. Yep. Single yeah, sing shot. that's a single, yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, Rose has got a new toy coming up. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> I'm just out of curiosity, what would be your pick? as an overall um, best macro lens to pick if you had to pick one? My, my favourite macro is the one that's um, next on this on this slideshow. It's a newer one. But I've got a, have you got a mirrorless camera or an SLR? I've got both. I just yeah, bought both. It. If you I do have mirrorless, one. I've it's fallen in love with the, with the new 85mm lens. Um, if you're going to shoot purely macro... If you're not using it for portraits, some people like a macro lens to use for portrait as well. So the 85mm is a 5.6. So it's not it's not as good as this would be for portraits because this will do 2.8. But I don't really shoot portrait that much. So I and the size of the 85mm is you'll see. I've actually taken a picture of it on my camera to show you why I like the 85mm lens. And for macro shots. <laughs> If it does 2.8, doesn't matter because you never shoot 2.8 at macro on macro. Like you 5.6 is probably just the beginning of where you would shoot in aperture on macro because you know your depth, especially at two to one, your focal length, your um your your depth of field is so small that the two the fact that it's not point two point eight is kind of irrelevant. Some people get hung up on the whole 2.8 thing a lot, but for um for macro photography, it's um, unless you, again you're, you're doing focus stacking. You just wouldn't shoot at 2.8 with a macro. Uh, I've got a 100 mil Canon macro. I yep. barely use it, but I've now got the R3 and I've got a heap of Canon um, cameras and Olympus cameras. Um, but with the R3, which is the new one, I was just interested to think what would be your overall uh, pick as a macro lens that you could use at a wide um sense of yeah you know, photography yeah well if you if you do want to use it for portraiture as well this one is what you want the 100 mil yeah um, I'm, not, I'm not into portrait otherwise i'd be using my yeah if you're not using for portrait i'd consider the 85 mil just because the size is so so nice again up next graham you can see what it does okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's a coffee bean i think we all know how big they are so you can get an idea of the detail on that this guy's pretty cool yeah eyes in the back of his head that's my portrait with the 100 mil just for um for context some people um want to know how they perform so this is my my favorite. I, I just like it because it's um in op, in terms of optics and what it does, it does pretty much what the other one does. It's not a 2.8. For me, that doesn't matter because you can see there everything's out of focus anyway, right? With macro depth of field is always a struggle. Um, but this physically in size and weight, it's nearly half of what the um 100 mil is. So if you've got a mirrorless camera, a lot of people like mirrorless because it's everything shrinking down and keeps your, your backpack load of gear smaller. This is a really nice physical size fit for a mirrorless camera. And also um, if you're hand holding with, you know, the less weight you're holding in your hands, the easier it is to keep steady, which gives you an extra stop or two maybe to play with uh, when you're shooting. That's pretty cool. Get, getting the flower and the, the dew drop. And, and haven't we got plenty of raindrops around in our gardens at the yeah. moment to yeah. go out and practice that sort of photography on? Plenty of raindrops on Sunday. If not, we'll yeah. get the hose out. <laughs> what, about no the, need. 
what mounts does it come in, Adam? Um, it's available in Sony mirrorless, Canon mirrorless, and Nikon mirrorless. So if you do want to use it on your SLR as well, this isn't the lens to pick. If you want to use it on both, what I would do is buy the 100 mil and buy an R or use your RF adapter, which I'm assuming you have. But there is a 100 mil EF, as we said before, in that that second box, depending on when it when it lands. You can see the struggle with the depth of field there, where the front of the mushroom and the back aren't in the same. Yeah. So two point eight is just overkill. It's just yeah, it's almost unusable. Yep. Because yeah, in that one you probably want to see both sides of the mushroom sharp. So this is when you use the five to one, so you don't have to get so close to the bug. Is that the uh, or to the alligator? Yeah, or maybe a, um, I think it's just a frog, but um, well, maybe a probe is handy too if you don't really don't want to get close to things. But these little jumping spiders seem to be favourites amongst. There's a certain type of spider that's very popular amongst the macro community. I don't know how they keep them still. Um, I don't either. I mean, that's why I think I've, I've, I know some of the good macro guys learn to actually focus stack handhelds they're not sitting there mucking around with tripods and stuff yeah just moving sometimes um sometimes when you see bugs with water droplets all over them it's because they've been in the freezer um <laughs> it's a slow them down a bit <laughs> yeah um it's pretty common and if you look if you're learning honestly if you're learning to do macro stuff shoving bugs in the freezer even if until they completely stop moving is is often a good way to learn macro to begin with hot tip Love this one. That's great. Just the Very colors good. in it are fantastic. It's a beauty. Yeah, again, it's, it's got a fairy it's head. That, it's that softness of the background for me is what makes it. So yeah, the depth of the field is not much, even at 5.6. Yep, just a single drop width. That's just landscape then, with the hundred mil, is it? Yeah, that's all with the with the eighty five mil. mil. Yep. yep. So that's just just using for general photography. Yep. People wondering what it's like because some macro lenses just fall apart when they're used at infinite. Like they, some macro lenses are really good macro, and then you shoot to infinity, and they just completely go to pieces. But these these do quite well still. Lost an antenna in the business. That's true. Now, this is this is my camera. Um, and I just quickly took this on my phone. Um, and I did it just so you guys know Size. how damn small this lens is. Hmm. So I have an A7C. Um, so for anyone not familiar with the Sony range, that's the smallest camera they make, which still has a full frame sensor. So I've always liked the idea of a, the smaller the camera, the better. Um, but I like the idea of a full frame sensor as well. And this is this was good for that. And I just this camera, this lens is a beautiful combination for that particular body. So it's keeping everything in a very, very compact package. So the 100 mil is like the same size as any other 100 mil macro. It's like nearly double that size. Uh, so that's that's why I like this lens. Oh, now the probe, yeah. Yeah, now I'll be up front. The probe lens is 90, I think well over 95% of people who buy this lens are people using it in broadcast or cine or video applications. We don't sell many to people using it for photography because you can probably do more in most situations with a lot of the other lenses that we have. And this is like an early $3,000 lens. Um, you would buy this for photography if you wanted to get the heck away from something. If you took a lot of photos of stuff you don't want to be close to. It is a 24mm lens, so it does give you a lot of 
width in the background. So it does give you quite a unique perspective. Um, and you could get it into places you can't get most lenses. In fact, the tip, if you look down the image of the tip back to as far as where that square bump is, it's also completely waterproof up to where that bump is. So you can submerge the front of this lens in, in the water um, and on the front of the lens itself built into it, there's actually an LED light built in, in around the lens tip. So the lighting on this is actually from the lens itself. So when you get into those little nooks and crannies, you obviously can't get a flash in there. Um, it doesn't matter because the light, the lens has got a light light on the end of it. So if you watch, um, you can, there's a, there's a David Attenborough, there's a new David Attenborough about tiny world or tiny creatures. It's been used on quite a lot, a lot of documentaries um, or even that Lego Masters show um, on Channel 9. There's shots, you can, you know straight away which shots are done with this lens because it goes into places that you couldn't fit a conventional lens. I think the little um, video coming up demonstrates it pretty well. Yeah, the, the people in video who have been using this lens have just been blowing my mind as far as how clever they've been getting with, with what they're doing with it. So, yeah, for photography, there might be a few instances like this where it's handy to have something, something where you don't get too close. So lots of spider shots with your, your probe lens. Yeah, or more the <laughs> bees and hornets would be my bigger worry. So this guy, he's got sunglasses on. With eyes in them. <laughs> you can actually see, go back to that photo. See his eyes on the side, on yeah. each side. Uh, that, you can actually the, see the uh, LEDs that are built into the lens. Okay, on the, so. Yeah, they're the, they're the LEDs that are actually built into the, the front of the lens. A tiny optic fiber then for the LEDs. Uh, no, it's just a ring of LEDs. Um, they got quite small, yeah. So this is the waterproof thing where you can put it in the water and... Yeah, I don't know if that's shot underwater or not. Uh, probably, because I don't, I don't think that's through glass. But yeah, it can shoot. We we sell... Um, there's a chap in Sydney who has a custom dive housing for this. So he's got a, a red cine camera and a slow-mo camera, like tens of thousands of dollars worth of video in a big, big, massive waterproof box. And then it's got a special port designed for this lens. And the, the lens kind of just pokes out the front like Mr. Squiggle used to poke out the front of that rocket. And just mm -hmm. it keeps sticking out the front because the tip itself is waterproof, but the rest of the gear is sealed away in a big waterproof housing. Cool. He, um, we had to replace the front element of the lens for him once because it got kicked by a, um, a mantis shrimp. <laughs> and I, don't, I don't know if anyone knows what a mantis shrimp is. I didn't know until I, I YouTubed it. Um, but a mantis shrimp basically can kick a shell open or they, there's demo, there's a videos you'll see online where it like breaks a Coke bottle and it can bust into a crab shell. It's got a special mechanism in it that can flick really fast and it can break through lots of stuff underwater and it actually cracked his um, front lens element. That's right. Hope you got the shot. Yeah, got some cool stuff, but yeah, it's a... Uh, Kill it. So this is a um, couple of creative applications for a um for it. You'll see the photo, then you'll see the setup in these in these two next shots. So he super glues the cap on and then takes the shot from underneath. Yep. Yeah. And just shops the um obviously chops the apparatus out of the frame. Yep. Cool. All right, I think this is where I have to play the play button, isn't it? Here we go. Yep. Is the sound coming through on that? <sighs>
do. Well, it's been an interesting lens for us because when they first said they were releasing it, I kind of didn't, I thought, oh, it's pretty niche, pretty boutique. And I didn't really think that there'd be a massive market for it, but we've sold tons of these in the city industry. Oh, that's pretty cool. I think it was worthwhile um, uh, when Adam and I were chatting about the presentation, there's so many sort of boutique lenses in the range rather than just look at the macro lenses on their own. And I thought it was good for everyone to uh, just explore the whole range. So um, and so we extended the uh, presentation to include all the other lenses and you can see uh, all the toys that uh, that he's got to, uh, to play with, which is fantastic.